Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. It's my pleasure to be here, and I'm most excited to get on with the business of uh, the next book that I intend to read on this program, a book that I've been anxious to get to ever since Inquisition Update began, one of the most powerful and educational books in my library. It's entitled The Papacy and the Civil Power. It was written by Richard Wigington Thompson, Secretary of the United States Navy. And I'll read, by way of introduction, a brief biography of R.W. Thompson, this from the Indiana State Library. Richard Wigginton Thompson was born on June 9, 1809, in Culpeper County, Virginia. In 1831, he moved to Kentucky and settled shortly thereafter in Lawrence County, Indiana. He began practicing law in Bedford, Indiana, after being admitted to the bar in 1834. Thompson served in the Indiana House of Representatives from 1834 to 1836 and in the Indiana Senate from 1837 to 1838. In 1836, he married Harriet Eliza Gardner, with whom he had eight children. He was elected to the United States House of Representatives in 1841 and in 1847. The Thompsons moved to Terre Haute, Indiana in 1843. He served as the city attorney there in 1846 and 1847. During the Civil War, he was the commander of Camp Thompson, Indiana, and provost marshal of the Terre Haute District. President Lincoln appointed him Collector of Internal Revenue for the 7th Indiana District, a, a post that Thompson held for one term, from 1864 to 1866. From 1867 to 1869, Thompson was Judge of the Fifth Circuit Court. President Rutherford B. Hayes appointed Thompson Secretary of the U.S. Navy. Thompson resigned from this position in 1881 to become chairman of the American Committee for the French Panama Canal Company. He also served as director of the Panama Railroad Company from 1881 to 1889. In addition to his life of public service, Thompson was the author of four books, including this book that I am about to read, The Papacy and the Civil Power. He died on February 9, 1900, in Terre Haute, Indiana. The Papacy and the Civil Power by Richard Wigginton Thompson, U.S. Secretary to the Navy under President Rutherford B. Hayes, and he begins his quote, uh, he begins his book by a quote from John Milton, Popery is a double thing to deal with and claims a twofold power, ecclesiastical and political, both usurped and the one supporting the other. And another quote, There is no usurpation so great as that of the Romans, who usurped the empire. Neither do I exempt, them from this, uh, exempt from this rule the priesthood, whose violence is double, inasmuch as it is doubled in the holding men under corporal and, and uh, spiritual authority, unquote, by Francis Gucciardini. This book was written in 1876, only six years after the First Vatican Council of 1870 and the proclamation of the dogma of papal infallibility, and a mere 12 years after Pope Pius IX published his Syllabus of Errors condemning all forms of popular government, most especially the government of the United States of America, a government of, by, and for the people. Pope Pius IX said the people need to be governed, and the only legitimate government of the world in the world is a government established by the papacy and subservient to the papacy. Now many discredit 
Richard Thompson, and especially that he was not well qualified to be Secretary of the Navy. But I assert after reading this book and studying this book that he was most supremely qualified to be U.S. Secretary to the Navy because he assessed the gravest threat to our Protestant form of government, the Roman Catholic Church. And I consider this book to be one of the most prophetic books in my library. Richard Wigginton Thompson foresaw the events taking place before our eyes today in Washington and in the churches, the overthrow of our Protestant faith, the overthrow of our Protestant institutions, and our Protestant Bill of Rights and Constitution, the overthrow of Protestant USA by the Roman Catholic hierarchy, particularly led by the Jesuit order. Now, to begin, I'm going to read the preface to this book. By the way, I want to remind you, the book was written in 1876. Keep this in mind, that during the 1800s, there was a grave concern in this country by, the, by knowledgeable people. What a threat that Roman Catholicism played in this country. The preface to the book. It has seemed to me for a long time that it was the duty of the American people, the people of the United States, to make themselves familiar with the history of the papacy, its relations to the civil power, and its attempted encroachments upon the rights of existing governments. This conviction caused me to enter upon the investigations which have resulted in the preparation of this volume, mainly for self-edification. And if the conclusions I have reached are not satisfactory to others, I shall be content if they are stimulating, uh, uh, they are stimulated to make like investigations for themselves. Having begun and prosecuted my labors from the Protestant standpoint, I am aware that the partisan defenders of the papacy and its enormous pretensions will assign everything I have stated, whether of fact or opinion, to the force of habit and prejudice of education. This prejudice is undoubtedly strong in all minds, and struggle against them as we may, we are all part to be influenced, more or less, by the current opinions prevailing among those with whom we habitually associate. But as I have not undertaken to discuss mere points of religious doctrine, or to treat of the dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church, except insofar as they have been employed to influence the civil policy and actions of government, I am unwilling to concede myself less able to discover and to declare the truth in reference to them than is a Roman Catholic to understand and describe the true character and tendencies of Protestantism. In the claim of impartiality and fairness, in all such matters, the advantage is on the side of the Protestant. Roman Catholic writers are led almost universally, by the very nature of their church organization, into intolerance and dogmatism. They are always ready to assume, without investigation or inquiry, whatsoever the papacy has done or taught from the beginning is unerringly right and true. They do not employ their individual reason or judgment to examine for themselves, but are content to accept whatsoever is announced by ecclesiastical authority. Since the recent decree of the Pope's infallibility, and remember this book is written in 1876, papal infallibility was declared by the, Count, the First Vatican Council in 1870, where the Pope was declared infallible the leader of the church, the undisputed leader of the church. He says they do not employ their individual reason or judgment to examine for themselves, but are content to accept whatsoever is announced by ecclesiastical authority. Since the recent decree of, popes, of the Pope's infallibility, 
This authority is all centered in him. He is made incapable of error in all that he has declared or shall hereafter declare in the domain of faith and morals. And every member of the Roman Catholic Church wins equal infallibility for himself only by the acceptance and promulgation of this doctrine. Speaking of infallibility, papal infallibility. And he says, not so with Protestants. He, that is the Protestant, appeals to reason, examines history himself, weighs both evidence and argument, and exercises his own intelligent judgment in separating right from wrong, truth from falsehood. While the papacy demands implicit and passive obedience, the entire submission of the whole man by the sacrifice of all his sense of personality, Protestantism encourages and develops this sense by treating every individual as endowed with the faculty of reason and as possessing the right to employ it for himself. Manifestly, he who does not do it is mere, quote, clay in the hands of the potter, unquote. I have endeavored to obtain the information upon which my conclusions are based without concerning myself about matters of religious faith any further than I have found religion and politics mix up, mixed up together. And then, only to the extent of ascertaining how far the world has been influenced by the union of church and state, and what the probable effects upon mankind would be if that union should again become general and universal. And I particularly appreciate uh, Richard Wigginton Thompson here, right at this moment, for, ad for acknowledging that there was once in history where the union of church and state was universal and general. And that union of church and state was the heyday of the papacy, where the papacy crowned and dethroned kings. The papacy uh, chose all the kings of Europe. He crowned them with his own hands. And when they disobeyed him, he overthrew their governments. Every government conformed to Roman Catholic canon law or the decrees of the papacy. The papacy ruled supreme over Europe. Okay, we call these the Dark Ages or the Middle Medieval Ages. This was before before the time of the Protestant Reformation, before the time when God's holy word was written in the vernacular languages so the people could read God's book for themselves. And that was the light of the Protestant Reformation, the word of God, when they finally realized that the papacy was none other than that which God had predicted to come, Antichrist. And they came out of the Roman Catholic Church. And the Bible became their source of faith and practice. Christ was king of his kingdom, and the Pope was Antichrist. That is the light of the Reformation, brought about by the Scriptures being read by the people and not just the Roman Catholic priesthood. And they took their faith into practice. They overthrew the papacy. They rebelled against Antichrist. They put Christ on his rightful throne. They proclaimed liberty to the captives. And then came the United States of America, a Protestant nation, a Protestant constitution, where religious liberty reigned, and man was allowed to use his own, his own intellect to read God's Word according to the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit and to govern his life according to God's law in subservience to his conscience. But this papacy that once ruled so supreme in Europe, was overthrown. And the papacy was looking for a new place wherein to recultivate his one-time supremacy. And he chose this nation. Richard Wigington Thompson was aware of this. 
And that's what this book is about. The author continues, he says, My toleration toward even the most violent and vindictive assailants of Protestantism is such as forbids that I should challenge the integrity of their motives or the sincerity of their convictions. I will not quarrel with them about their religious opinions. They're, these are to be judged of by an authority, capital A, far higher than any earthly tribunal, at the final bar where we shall all meet, and by a judge, capital J, to whose sentence, whether of approval or condemnation, every one of us must submit. It is, <clears throat> excuse me, it is far more agreeable to me to concede, as I readily and, cherish, uh, and cheerfully do, that there is much in the antiquity and history of the Roman Catholic Church to enlist our admiration, much that has benefited the world by the dissemination of good and benign influences. But if I have found in Protestantism, as exists in the United States under the shelter of our popular institutions, that which has disseminated the same influences in a far greater degree, that which has done more to improve, advance, and elevate the world, and that which on these accounts is to be preferred, it would be found to be because, uh, excuse me, it will be found to be because papal imperialism originating in worldly motives and founded upon temporal ambitions has led this grand old church, the Roman Catholic Church, by means of an external ecclesiastical organization far away from its original apostolic simplicity and purity. Such are my habits of thought. Possibly from professional training, remember he was a judge and an attorney, that I have taken but little for granted. But in order to exercise an intelligent judgment as far as possible, have examined and weighed all the evidence within my reach, as I would that bearing upon any con controverted point about which I have no personal information. It is no easy matter to separate the true from the false in history, either secular or ecclesiastical. It requires the most careful and searching examination of authorities, often in conflict with each other and sometimes with themselves. It is not safe to accept all that is recorded as true or to reject it as false. Nor should that degree of mor uh, moral evidence which amounts to positive demonstration be required. We should be satisfied with such proof as establishes the reasonable probability of any given statement of facts. The degree of evidence necessary to establish a fact is, in a great measure, influenced by the nature of the fact itself, always involving the preliminary inquiry whether it is appropriate or inappropriate to it. Evidence is but little value unless it satisfies the mind and conscience. A reasonable man will require nothing more and should be satisfied with nothing less. The difficulties in relation to the rules of evidence are greater or less according to the nature of our experience and observation of human affairs and our comprehension of the motives of men and societies. Our common sense is the best and safest guide because it is not likely to lead us into those obscure and difficult paths where men are so often and so unprofitably carried by mere scholastic learning and from which they cannot ex extricate themselves without the assistance of those who designedly conduct them there. There are many things entitled to be recognized without proof. Everything which partakes of the nature of a public act, general laws and customs, matters which concern a whole people or the government of a country, and such things as would naturally happen in the ordinary course of events, are all of this character. To reject these would be to remove all the foundations and landmarks of history. It should not be forgotten that in the investigation of events far removed from our time, we are compelled to, in, 
to acquire information of them only through the perception of others and not our own. In reference to such events, credulous minds are too apt to give implicit credit to whatsoever is recorded, incredulous minds too apt to reject it. To avoid these extremes, we should keep our minds in the evenly balanced condition, without inclining either to the side of belief or disbelief, so that when all the evidence is accessible to us shall be applied, we may allow the scale to preponderate on that side where the most reasonable probability lies, that is, where the result is consistent with the knowledge of the facts already known to us. These are recognized and well-established rules of evidence. They govern us in our ordinary intercourse with the world. And as they have guided me throughout my investigations, I have deemed it proper to state them, that others may understand the process of my reasoning and be able to test the accuracy of my conclusions. These investigations, having been prosecuted when all the circumstances connected with the present demands of the papacy are calculated to impress my uh, demands of the papacy are calculated to impress my mind with their magnitude and importance, I have endeavored to divest myself of all undue and improper prejudice, and to conduct them in the spirit of toleration and with all reasonable impartiality. I hope I have succeeded in this because I have no wish to convey to the minds of others any belief or impressions except such as may meet the approval of their own reason and judgment, that I may have erred in admitting, in, in admitting or rejecting evidence, in giving too great or too little weight to it when received, or may have reached improper or unwarrantable conclusions, it is altogether probable." For unlike the supporters of the papacy, I lay no claim to infallibility or even to exemption from ordinary frailty. This is all I claim, that I have endeavored to be candid and to state the convictions of my mind as inoffensively as possible, being content that others shall decide for themselves how far they are right or how far wrong. During this celebrated controversy between Dr. Breckenridge and Archbishop Hughes some years ago, the former, Dr. Breckenridge, had occasion to make a quotation from the Catechism of the Council of Trent, and not having the original before him, took it from the works of Archbishop Usher, uh, Archbishop Usher one of the most learned and extensively known of the English divines. Making no immediate question about the correctness of the quotation, Archbishop Hughes thus, in a seemingly supercilious air, evaded the matter. Quote, Who is this, who the, excuse me, who this usher is, he said, I am at a loss to conjecture. There is an author of that name, but he does not possess much authority with Catholics for the reason that he happens to be a Protestant archbishop, unquote. Illiberality of this kind is calculated rather to mislead and deceive than to discover the truth, and I have not suffered myself to be betrayed by it. It should be slow to conclude that a Roman Catholic writer is to be discredited merely on the account of his religious belief or what a Protestant says to be accepted as unconditionally true merely because he is a Protestant. He's setting forward his level of integrity of his book, asserting that his assessments will be made based on the facts, the objective facts. He is setting forth his intellectual integrity, and that his assertions and assessments will not be based on anti-Roman Catholic bigotry or prejudice or uh, an excessively pro-Protestant point of view. And he challenges the readers to see his assessments and do their own research to validate what he says. And he gives an example of intellectual dishonesty here. He says, during the celebrated controversy between Dr. Breckenridge and Archbishop Hughes some years ago, 
The former had occasion to make a quotation from the Catechism of the Council of Trent, and not having the original before him, took it from the works of Archbishop Usher, one of the most learned and extensively known of the English divines. Now, Usher was obviously a Protestant. Now, it says, making no immediate question about the correctness of the quotation, Archbishop Hughes, the Roman Catholic, thus in a seemingly supercilious air, evaded the matter. Quote, Who this usher is, he said, I am at a loss to conjecture. There is an author of that name, but he does not possess much authority with Catholics for the reason that he happens to be a Protestant archbishop, unquote. In other words, Protestants aren't honest, aren't authoritative, just because they're Protestants, right? Now the author continues, he says, illiberality of this kind is calculated rather to mislead and deceive than to discover the truth. And I have not suffered myself to be betrayed into it. I should be slow to conclude that a Roman Catholic writer is to be discredited merely on account of his religious belief, or that what a Protestant says is to be accepted as unconditionally true merely because he is a Protestant. At the risk of swelling this volume to an undesirable size, I have made extended quotations from different authors and from the bulls, encyclicals, etc. of the popes. This is deemed preferable to briefer extracts and condensed statements because it furnishes the means of testing the fairness and accuracy both of criticisms and of arguments. When I have found an author manifestly a mere partisan on either side, I have endeavored not to be biased by his influence. Cormenin, who we've mentioned many times on Inquisition Update, he's often referenced as a Roman, a Roman Catholic historian. Cormenin, although not a Protestant, seems to me to be too sweeping in his denunciations of many of the popes, and therefore has excited in my mind such suspicion of, him, uh, of his impartiality that I have adopted his personal opinions in but few instances. Some of his pictures of the general corruption and depravity prevailing at Rome must be too highly colored. I know of no reason, however, why he should be any more discredited than other historians upon general questions of fact. As my inquiries have prosecuted, the mid <clears throat> have prosecuted in the midst of active business occupations with the assistance of only very limited and self-acquired knowledge of classical learning and with no access to a single authority or volume beyond my own private library, this book is not designed for the instruction of the educated classes who have the means of making like inquiries for themselves. It is intended for the people who, in the main, are without these means and who are the final arbiters upon all public questions. If their intention shall be arrested by it, excuse me, if their attention shall be arrested by it, and they shall be excited to additional diligence in guarding the civil and religious rights guaranteed to them by the government of the United States, it will concern me very little to know that it has convite, uh, <clears throat> it will concern me very little to know that it is a, it has invited criticism or that I on account of it have incurred the animosity and anathemas of such as paying for the protection of our institutions given them by Jesuitical plottings to establish a holy Roman empire upon their ruins very powerful uh, final uh, salvo in this preface. We must guard our Protestant liberties and our Protestant Constitution, lest the Jesuits overthrow it and impose upon us a papal dictatorship. In common language that can be understood by the common people, that was the concern of Richard Wigginton Thompson, Secretary of the U.S. Navy, 
back in 1876. Are we still diligent to preserve our Protestant institutions, our free institutions, our Constitution that guarantees us liberty that was gained for us by the Protestant Reformation and the overthrow of papal supremacy? Are we still diligent to protect those liberties that we have in Christ? And if not, what efforts have the papacy made to overthrow our Constitution, to overthrow Protestantism, to overthrow the Bible, to overturn Christ's throne, and to seat himself upon it and upon our government? That's the question that so concerned Richard Wigginton Thompson back in 1876, 150 years ago. What has transpired in this last 150 years? If you take a realistic look, Richard Wigginton Thompson's concerns were vital, and we failed to heed his warnings. Now Rome is back in control, and she used our Protestant nation to get control. It's the worst of all scenarios. Now, Chapter 1 of The Papacy and the Civil Power by Richard Wigginton Thompson is an introductory chapter, and it's going to deal with Roman Catholics in the United States their schools under foreign priests and Jesuits, they accept the Pope's infallibility, the hierarchy and the layman, yes, there is a difference, a very marked difference between the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church and the layman, the pew-sitters, the government of the United States, it is opposed, uh, it is opposed as us usurpation because it's not founded on religion, the Roman Catholic Church must rule in both spirituals and temporals. The people need a master. Their whole duty is obedience, infallibility, the old and new doctrine, and the encyclical of the syllabus of Pope Pius IX. This is a very powerful chapter, and it sets the foundation for what will transpire in the rest of this book. And I hope you'll pay very close attention to this first chapter. He says, Many persons now living will remember when there were very few Roman Catholics in the United States compared with the bulk of the population, and none at all in some of the oldest and most densely populated parts of the country. With the exception of the, uh, the descendants of the Maryland colonists, and those who had settled in Louisiana before its purchase, they were to be found only in the frontier, in the large cities, and with here and there a church in the interior. They were not sufficiently numerous to have attracted any special attention, and were generally and generously accepted by Protestants as co-workers in the cause of Christianity." they were not disposed to invite any antagonism with the prevailing Protestant faith, and when such antagonism was known to exist, were prompt and emphatic in rebuking it. Their priests appeared to be humble and unpretending men, professing only the single object of serving their divine master, and seemingly ready, when stricken upon one cheek, to turn the other. Humility was one of their most prominent characteristics. It's otherwise now. There are seven archbishops, 53 bishops, six vicars of apostolic, priests whose numbers it is impossible to compute, and a membership variously estimated by the official organs of the Roman Catholic Church at from six to eight millions, about one-sixth of our population. Now, take special note of this. At the time of the writing of the book, it was estimated by the Roman Catholic Church hierarchy 
that Catholics possessed about one sixth of the uh, of the population of this country. We're in excess of twenty five percent now in this country now today. Now it is asserted that there are over four hundred educational institutions in the different states and territories besides many private schools, under the immediate and exclusive government of the papal hierarchy. In these schools, without any exception, it is made absolutely and indispensably necessary that the dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church shall be taught to all pupils as the beginning and the end of all necessary education that it shall be fixed in their minds as a sentiment of religious faith, that since the decree of papal infallibility, they owe, within the domain of faith and morals, a higher allegiance to the Pope of Rome than to the government of the United States, or that of any state, and that any violation of this allegiance will bring upon them the severest censures of the Church and inevitably lead to their eternal punishment in the world to come. There were recently 1,113 teachers in charge of these institutions. They have been selected for this particular duty on account account of their submissive obedience to the Pope and his American hierarchs. And besides these, it is said that there are 2,383 sisters of various orders who have in their hands the training and education of the aggregate number of 33,853 female pupils. In a late work, the following reference is made to the rapid growth of Romanism in the United States. Quote, But it is in our country, above every other, that the recent gains of Romanism upon Protestantism are the most remarkable. At the close of the two centuries and a half that elapsed from the first settlement of Virginia to the year 1859, the number of Catholics in the United States had run up to two millions and a half only. But at the end of the nine years that succeeded, namely, 1868, that number had doubled. Twelve years ago, they were but a twelfth part of the population. Today, they constitute probably more than a seventh, unquote. In the same work, a compilation is made from a source considered entirely reliable as follows. Number of Protestants in the United States in 1859, 21 million. Number of Catholics in the United States in 1859, 2,500,000. Number of Protestants in the United States as of 1868, 27 million. Number of Catholics in the United States as of 1868, 5 million. Showing that the Catholics had increased in the nine years from 1859 to 1868, 100%, while the Protestants had increased in the same time less than 29%. Then commenting upon these important and startling facts, the author continues, quote, Those who will verify the calculation of future increase, supposing it to continue at the same relative ratio for four terms of nine periods, uh, nine years each, Commencing from the year 1868, you will find that in 1904, that is, in 33 years from today, there would be 80 millions of Catholics to less than 75 million Protestants in the American Union, unquote. While it is not by any means certain that the relative ratio of increase here assumed will be borne out by future developments, an exceedingly... and exceedingly probable that it will not be, yet the facts stated show so great and rapid an increase of the Roman Catholic part of our population as to render it an important and necessary inquiry whether or not there is anything in the demands and teachings of the papacy which require that so large a body of the citizens of this country 
shall put themselves, either now or hereafter, in opposition to the principles we are endeavored as a nation to perpetuate by our civil institutions. No matter if there are thousands of them who would refuse to do so, if required even by the Pope, this does not diminish the importance and necessity of the inquiry. Institutions of the popular form require more than those of other forms to be guarded by ceaseless and untiring vigilance. There's no way of ascertaining with precision what proportion of the Roman Catholic educational institutions in this country are under Jesuit direction and management. That the number is large may be inferred from a a boast made not long ago by the editor of a newspaper zealously devoted to the interests of the Jesuit order. With extraordinary vehemence and with some talent from the dogmatic and declamatory style of writing, he has industriously employed his columns to advance the cause of the papacy in the United States, to bring about the destruction and overthrow of Protestantism, and to elevate the Pope to an equality with God in the government of all human affairs." With an air of self-satisfied pride and arrogance, he announced that these followers of Loyola, the Jesuits, who have, in the course of their history, been driven out of every Roman Catholic country on account of the enormity of their offenses against society, have now twelve colleges under their charge, and that, quote, it is clear that the Catholic intellectuality of the land depends almost entirely on these Jesuit institutions. Had they never been opened here, there had been a dense state of darkness over us all. Were they closed tomorrow, an eclipse would set in which would be impossible to dissipate. And if decay attacked them, the brightness of the Catholic name in the United States would be soon a dissolved glory." Unquote. So this author places a great deal of emphasis on the importance of these Jesuit institutions for the survival of Roman Catholicism in this country. Now it says in a subsequent number of this same paper, it is stated that, quote, there are about 300 Jesuit priests in the United States, unquote. That, in addition to the above colleges, quote, there is one immense scholasticate, or house of studies, for all North America, unquote, located in Maryland, with, quote, about 150 young Jesuits within its walls, unquote, and where, quote, at length, the Jesuits of this country have commenced to educate their scholastics according to the time-honored rules of their society. Hitherto, unquote, it is said, quote, the demand for professors and priests has been so urgent that this could not have been easily done. But the long wished for beginning is now at last made, and nothing will be suffered to interfere with the scholastic in going to, th- to his studies at the proper time and in con- and in completing them in all their extent, variety, and rigor. The result in a few years will be seen all over the land, unquote. So it is acknowledged that these Jesuit priests and these Jesuit institutions are going to make a very significant change in our land. This is admitted by this Roman Catholic author. Now, Thompson says, we may reasonably expect that the numbers of this celebrated society in the United States, speaking of the Jesuits, would now be rapidly increased by immigration. Their suppression by the Prussian government, like uh, their like fate in Italy, their difficulties in Bavaria and Switzerland, growing out of their resistance to the public authorities, their expulsions from Guatemala, 
and their probable expulsion from all the countries where they have been longest and best known, and where the obnoxious principles of their order and its insidious workings are understood, will probably cause them to seek refuge in this country, where under the license of our Protestant and tolerant institutions, they may hope to give new life to their organization and perpetuate its existence." The author's telling us here that the Jesuits were rejected all throughout Europe. They were cast out of every nation in Europe. Every Roman Catholic nation in Europe kicked the Jesuits out. And that the Jesuits were going to use our religious liberty here in the United States to give them refuge. And the implication is clear that they would use the United States of America to regather the strength of the Jesuits and to continue upon their conquest of world supremacy for the papacy from their home base right here in Protestant USA. And that's what history will prove to be true. The author continues, he says, the field is an inviting one, rich in everything that attracts And we must not suppose that they will be slow to occupy it. For even the Jesuit, when driven away from the Roman Catholic nations and covered by them with a blokey and reproach, can find shelter under our constitution and laws. The only price he is expected to pay is fidelity to the fundamental principles upon which our government has been founded. With less than this, we have no right to be content, and must not be. There are very few thoughtful minds that have not been impressed by the fact that these educational influences are, with only occasional and rare exceptions, under the immediate direction of foreigners, of men educated and trained by the papacy for the express purpose. Why is this? Why is it that only those who are thus prepared for the work, with all the peculiar opinions, prejudices, and habits of thought which grow out of and belong to the papal system, as understood at the Vatican in Rome, are especially and almost exclusively chosen to teach Roman Catholicism in the United States? Unquestionably, there is some reason for it. And it would seem to be the only satisfactory explanation of such a fact that in the opinion of the ecclesiastical authorities of Rome, there is so direct an antagonism between the papacy and a popular form of government like ours that they do not suppose it possible for both systems to exist permanently together and therefore have selected these foreigners as the most suitable and competent agents to carry on the work of substituting other institutions for ours, institutions more congenial to them and more in harmony with the papal views of government. This precautionary measure of ecclesiastical policy carefully designed for the achievement of future results has borne some fruits already. We see this in the fact that the members of the Roman Catholic Church of the United States appear today to be more formidably and compactly united in supporting and defending all the pretensions of the papacy than are the Roman Catholic populations of any of the nations of Europe. Among the most intelligent of the latter, those who have become familiar from long observation and direct intercourse with the papal system, the foundations of that system have been destroyed. Papal concordats have been indignantly and contemptuously revoked. Papal bulls and anathema and excommunication have been defied, and the ecclesiastical right to proclaim and enforce the decrees of papal infallibility have been courageously and successfully resisted. Not so in America because of these Jesuit institutions. And this corruption continues in magnificent form today 